Hello and welcome to the Spike Podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and I'm delighted to welcome in the studio with me for the first time on the show, uh, Trigonometry's Francis Foster. Hello, mate. How are you? Very good, thanks. Great to have you. And joining us down the line, live from Luton, we have Spike's columnist, Rakeev Essan. Thank you for having me. Cheers, Rakeev. And coming up on today's show, we've got Nigel Farage versus Woke Capitalism, the driver's revolt against greenism and Labour's flip-flopping on the trans debate. So the Nigel Farage scandal has exploded this week. I mean, it's been rumbling on for the past month or so, but now we've had the CEO of NatWest, Dame Alison Rose, has resigned. The head of Coots, the actual elite bank that Farage was banking with, has resigned. There's an information commissioner's uh, investigation going on into Coots and their debanking of Nigel Farage or uh, the CEO's leaking of information about Farage. I mean, this is out of control now, Francis. What is going on? The thing that I found most interesting about this case wasn't actually the case itself, but it's the incredibly stupendous arrogance of these people that they yeah. thought they could debank one of the most prominent political commentators of the past however many years, one of the most prominent political figures who you could argue single-handedly changed the course of this country. And you expected him, A, not to find out, and yeah. B, to shut up about it. Now, if you know Nigel, as we all do, the man likes to chat. Mm. So it's ridiculous. And they thought that they were going to get away with it and he wasn't going to skewer them, which he absolutely did. But also, I mean, what, what's interesting, the, the arrogance is a really important thing to mm. point out because it's not just they thought they would get away with it. They thought it was their job to tell their customers and implicitly, you know, the broader public as well, these banks think it's their job to tell us what to think, to tell us what we can and can't say, to say that um, we have to agree with pride, for instance, we have to agree, mm. agree with trans ideology. You can't, as Nigel Farage did, uh, as he was revealed to have done in this dossier they compiled against him, you can't criticize net zero. You can't criticize Black Lives Matter. This you is why I spike bingo. I know, right? You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, cons ting, ting, you can't consort ting. with Novak Djokovic, <laughs> yeah. the unvaccinated tennis player. Have you mentioned Brexit yet? I haven't mentioned Brexit. I'm sure <laughs> the bit, that's obviously the big um, cross against his name. But it's, it's not just that they went after Nigel Farage, which is just which is foolish mm. um, and has backfired on them, but also they really thought it was their job to tell us what to say and think. Oh, absolutely. And it shows their arrogance and it shows their entitledness. And it also shows that they absolutely 100% believe that they know more than you, that they are better than you, and that if you disagree with them, then gloves are off and they're going to make you pay for it. And that's that's their attitude. And Rakeeb, I mean, this is, you know, a serious issue. It's bigger than Farage. Uh, people are worried that um, anyone who expresses a contrary view could be debanked. There's been cases, lots of cases of this happening to ordinary people. So why do you think the left has been kind of either missing in action in this debate or has, in some cases, actually sided with Coots? Oh, it's absolutely remarkable, Fraser, just seeing one Labour representative after the other um, defending the indefensible mm. uh, when it comes to the coots farad scandal. Uh, we had uh, Rachel Reeves talking about Dame Alison Rose, that, uh, suggesting that she's been bullied um, <laughs> over all this. They're you know, talking about how she's the first um, female CEO of Coots, um, of NatWest, sorry, you know, playing uh, identity politics. And, and I think what, what's really interesting is that it, there's a great deal of political immaturity on the left. They, they don't seem to understand the fact that it is important to defend someone's social and economic rights even if they have different views to you mm. on admittedly sensitive issues. And I think that's where you see Labour siding with a deeply inappropriate behaviour by a so-called business leader in the banking industry, yeah. which, is, which is absolutely remarkable. I would have thought that calling out authoritarianism, which it is in the banking industry, um, would have been an open goal for the Labour Party. And it was an opportunity to cultivate support for uh, cultural change and greater legal regulations of, of the banking sector. But I suspect um, the Labour Party is quite keen to 
look as pro business as possible. Yeah, and they're looking to generate uh, income and bring in hefty donations from the from financial services and the banking industry, which is precisely why it's taken the side that it has over the Coots Farage affair. And and Francis, I mean, this really to build on what Keith's saying. There's a principle at stake here. Yeah, you know, free speech is at stake. Mm-hmm. Democratic norms are at stake. Where you know we don't expect businesses to decide um, what it, what is a correct view and what isn't. I mean, that's surely why can't people see that? Well, this is a remarkable thing about this entire case, which people haven't really been focusing on. Bankers are taking the moral high ground. Mm. When did you ever look at a banker and go, you know what, mate? Yeah, you are the one that I want to live my life like. Yeah. You are the one stumbling out of string fellows with a nosebleed because you've done too much, Charlie. <laughs> you're the one that I want to look up to and think, you know what, mate? You're a paragon of moral virtue. Dan, you know what? I reckon if Jesus was alive today, mate, he would he'd be a banker. <laughs> well, he might, yeah, maybe he'd work at Coots and would be decorating the, you know, building with the pride flag like as as has happened. I mean, Ricky, but it's like a remarkable transformation, not just on the left becoming pro bank, but also big business seemingly siding with what appear to be progressive causes. I wouldn't say they're particularly progressive, but it, it there is a sense that you know business has gone woke. What what do you think is driving that? Well, I, I think that there's many people in the banking industry that, that they know for well how much damage they've caused the country, especially over the 2008 uh, financial crisis, uh, and and I think that a, a way. They look to compensate for that is now attaching themselves to these sort of social justice causes, and perhaps it's also, and the cynic in me suspects that it's also a tactic to deflect attention away from deeply unethical practices, mm. which are very much rooted in the in the banking industry. So I think that, that those are the possible factors which are driving this kind of behaviour, and 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 I think that we're going to see more of this so-called woke capitalism, where as opposed to giving people um, greater rights, um, employee protections, and all the rest of it, you're going to see uh, big corporations, banks, and all the rest of it, they're going to attach themselves to fashionable um, social justice causes, as opposed to doing the bread and butter of providing better worker conditions. Yeah, or even just providing the the services that they're supposed to of be course, providing. Absolutely. Um, and, and Francis, you know, this goes beyond the banks, um, or at least the sort of high street banks. Uh, there's been lots of stories about mm-hmm. PayPal essentially uh, getting rid of customers, including the Free Speech Union. Irony of ironies mm-hmm. there, denying them their right to free speech. And you've had a similar problem at trigonometry. It would be remiss not to talk a bit about that, your banking issues. So the the thing is with our banking issues is they were splendidly opaque about it. Mm. So they they first messaged us on an app, on the app. Didn't this, even, is, this is Tide, is that Tide right? Bank, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and they didn't even send us an email. They just sent us a message on the app. Mm. And then when we asked why, they basically weren't really giving an answer. Mm. And the answer that they gave wasn't really good enough. And then so what we did is then we we put it out to Twitter and then it, it went viral. And at which point they started backtracking hastily. Yeah. And then they told us it was because we were receiving donations mm. and they wouldn't be able to track those donations. So basically, if you save the children, don't go on Tide. <laughs> I mean, in in a way, this this opaqueness is quite similar to um, what Nigel Farage was dealing yeah. because for weeks, you know, it wasn't clear what exactly had led to his debanking. You know, mm. the bank essentially was maintaining that it was a commercial decision. Alison Rose, I mean, the main reason she had to resign, the CEO of NatWest, was because she told the BBC falsely that he had, uh, you know, he, his accounts had gone over the required wealth threshold. Yeah. I mean, do you think that that is a problem that essentially this is happening, but banks aren't even owning up to it? Well, it is. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's Nobody's owning up to it. Everybody is actually 
essentially pushing this agenda. And if you don't, if you're not on board with this particular agenda, which with this prog progressive way of looking at the world, then woe betide you because you're going to get demonetized you're, you're on YouTube. Your PayPal account is going to get is going to get cancelled. Mm. Etsy already in on it as well. We know that Colin Wright, the biologist, was was cancelled off Etsy. So it's all these companies, and I find it really, really funny that a bank where you need three million quid to open an account talks about being inclusive. <laughs> Does no one see the irony of that? Well, it's, it's irony on two levels, isn't it? Isn't it because it's you know exclusive in terms of wealth, no. but also the very word inclusive is a kind of Orwellian phrase. It means we're going to exclude you if you're on the wrong side of the debate, as they see it, or the wrong side of history, as they like to. Yeah, yeah, as, yeah. as a phrase that makes me it boils my urine. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe we can be pretty confident that if we're on the wrong side of the banks, then we're probably on the right side of history. Exactly. If we're on the side of free speech and democracy, then that's the right side of history rather than um, you know this kind of strange authoritarian movement that is shutting down dissent, that is essentially unpersoning people for having uh, views the elite don't like. And, and this is the other part of it, because people go, oh, you know, they're just a private company. They're allowed to, you know, they're allowed to give... Uh, bank accounts to who they want. Well, they're not really because 40% of them of that company is actually owned by the taxpayer, number one. And actually, number two as well, if you get debanked for whatever reason, it is far more difficult to open a bank account mm. because banks will quite rightly go, well, why is it that you've been kicked off this bank? What, what are you doing that is potentially dodgy? Yeah. And the reality is, is because, you know, you said trans women aren't women. Hello everyone, it's Tom Slater here, editor of Spiked. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's gone out and bought a copy of Brendan O'Neill's brilliant Spiked book, A Heretic's Manifesto. It's been great reading all of your emails, your glowing Amazon reviews. Thanks so much for getting behind it. The response with the reviews and the media has been brilliant as well. So if you haven't already purchased your copy of Brendan O'Neill's A Heretic's Manifesto, what are you waiting for? It's the book that comes highly recommended by Andrew Doyle, Julia Hartley Brewer, Michael Schellenberger, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Tony Abbott, and Spike readers everywhere. So to get your hands on a copy, stop what you're doing right now and go to Amazon.com or Amazon.co.uk to order yourself a copy. So following last week's by-elections and the surprisingly good result for the Conservatives, a lot of government ministers uh, and even Labour are starting to wonder out loud whether they should ease up a little bit on the green agenda. Um, Rakeeb, I mean, what have you made of this? Do you think, obviously, ULES, the ultra-low emission zone, played a massive role in the Uxbridge by-election, but a lot of people are trying to say that this is specific to Uxbridge, that's specific to ULES, or do you think there's a broader lesson? Well, I think that firstly, it was a terrible result for the Labour Party mm. um, not to gain Uxbridge and South Royslip. And there's no doubt that ULES, Mercedes um, Cons, ULES scheme played a critical part um, in, in that by-election result. I, I think it's personally bonkers to, to propose the expansion of ULES to parts of outer London, such as Uxbridge and South Royslip. Uh, I know those neck of the woods quite well, and I can tell you some parts of that constituency, I'd go as far as saying, I, I'd describe them as semi-rural, yeah. mm. if truth be told, with limited public transportation services. And I, and I think that's the point, really, that people are pursuing these kind of green agendas without thinking about what kind of position it could put everyday people in. Um, and the reality is there's many hard-pressed motorists. Many of them have work who work in trades who need to use their vehicle. Mm. Um, and they're being whacked with the charge of £12.50 a day just to go into town in the middle of a cost of living crisis as well. These are people who may have young children. Yeah, It is absolutely remarkable. I consider ULES to be anti-family and anti-worker. Uh, and, and I think that when we're looking at Uxbridge and South Royslip, of course, ULES played a part. But I think that the one thing that has been somewhat overlooked is the fact that it has a, a decent proportion of um, Indian heritage voters. Mm. And we've talked about this before, that in recent times, aspirational um, Indian heritage voters, especially in parts of West London, um, th 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 they've, they've really um, distanced themselves from Labour in recent times. So, of course, ULES played a part in that result. But I think there's a wider problematic trend for the Labour Party in that they're losing 
traditional ethnic minority voters who can't relate to the party very much. And and sort of going back to the the kind of green aspects. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the things I've been struck by uh, this week is there's been a kind of rear guard action to say no, you know, this is just Duxbridge. Everyone else loves green taxes. They're desperate. People are desperate to be taxed off the road. They they're clamouring for their boilers to be banned. They love just stop oil. I mean, <laughs> is that is that true? Do you rec- do you recognise that sentiment out there uh, in the masses? <laughs> well, you know I represent the masses, don't you, Fraser? <laughs> That's, That's what, what I do, mate. That's what I'm here. I'm the voice of the people. Bring him out. He's white. He's got the voice of a racist. Let's get him talking. <laughs> uh, but I love Sadiq Khan because I think he is the hub for every shit idea there's ever been. <laughs> I just love him. I love him. It's like he he's so bad. It's like he's doing it deliberately. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, do you remember when I, I, it was during the pandemic and it was New Year's Eve and then he put... On the sky, uh, there was a Black Lives Matter fist, and then yeah. there was also the EU. And it's just going, who are you doing this for? There was a, there was a Captain Tom in, in, with a Zimmer frame as well. Absolutely. I, was, I enjoyed that. Yeah, exactly. And then he did the mate campaign. Have you seen this? Yeah, say mate to a mate. So this mate. is to stop yeah. sexual harassment, you say. And m- violence and assault, because yeah. that's how you stop a rapist. You go mate, and then they stop. Yeah. And now this, and you just could think to yourself, going, People are already struggling, mm. really struggling. There's people actually looking at their household bills, their mortgage, their rents, their food, and going, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I genuinely don't know how I'm going to make it to the end of the month. And now you're going to whack this on top of it, yeah. and then you're surprised when people don't vote for you. I mean, Rakeem, there is this idea um, in sort of green circles that driving is basically non-essential, and therefore, it's okay to tax and restrict it because, you know, we should all be driving a bit less anyway to to save the planet. I mean, how on earth does that... Clearly, that can't survive contact with um, democracy around the rest of the country. No, absolutely. And, I, and I'll make the point that in, in many parts of the country, car ownership is required. But I think there's a, there's a point here with the Green Agenda where... They've given up on sort of longer term sustainable alternatives. I think the discussion should be how do we encourage people to give up their car as opposed to financially forcing them to giving up well, driving. How do we come up with an, alter- an alternative, alternative like, but you know, decent buses, decent trains? It'd be a start. It It'd be, be a start. Right? Yeah. I, I think that making upgrade is significant upgrades to social infrastructure. I think that incentivizing the purchase of cleaner vehicles. Mm -hmm. Um, There's many people who would probably want to clean a vehicle, but when you talk about, you know, there's a lack of battery stations to charge up the cars and all the rest of it, we need, if you want to bring about this environmental development, you need to have the infrastructure to go with that. Yeah. And, and I think there's even discussions about how do you make walking more attractive. I think many people in um, not just London, but in, in, in other parts of the country, they, they feel unsafe after a certain time in terms of walking. They don't see it as an attractive option. And I just think that many of these discussions need to be had if we're talking about a genuinely inclusive environmental agenda, which encourages people to go about their lives in a more environmentally friendly way, as opposed to financially forcing them to take a decision based on your eco-radical agenda. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people, maybe when they hear about net zero, mm. they think, oh, it's, you know, wind farms and solar panels. Yeah. And that might explain why some of the polling suggests that people are in favor broadly of kind of climate action. But when you get down to kind of brass tacks, actually what it tends to mean, in fact, there's the Climate Change Committee, which advises the government on climate change, says 62% of all net zero emissions cuts have to come from what they call behavior change. So it's not going to be just alternatives that are either you know, about the same or slightly worse. It's actually they do want you to drive less, eat less meat, uh, travel less on foreign holidays. I mean, that's just not a very appetizing prospect for the future, is it? It's not a very appetizing prospect for the future. And the best bit of it is they'll lecture you and they'll do all of that. Yeah, exactly. So, so they'll come out and give you a good old lecture and be like, "Look, sorry, you're gonna, um, you're gonna have to eat cockroaches from now on in, <laughs> and you're gonna have to go everywhere by milk float." <laughs> and we're very sorry about that, but we've got to save the planet anyway. I'm off on my private jet to go to fly to France so I can get my locally reared steak. Mm. And and that's how they are. And you, But you see it with all these people as well. And you see it with people like Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil. None of them seem to have a clue about what to do. All they want to do is stick themselves to things. Yeah. 
That's it. Mm. That's it. So we're not even having a reasonable discussion. Well, I mean, because the, what they're proposing is so unreasonable. You know, the, <laughs> the, end, the end of fossil fuels uh, is going to be a lot more dangerous than climate change. You would have thought, you know, stopping people from driving, stopping, you know, getting rid of fertilizer, something people don't talk about, you know, getting rid of ele- vast amounts of electricity. I mean, that's just dangerous. It's not even just economically, you know, problematic. Well, this is what happens when you let really rich, middle-class people who are very stupid have the podium. (laughs) They come up with ideas like this. They've never suffered. They've never strived. They've never had to work for anything. And then they they, they come up with with these types of ideas, and they don't understand the effect that this has on ordinary people. For the vast majority of people in this country, if you get to the end of your month with your bills paid, with food on the table, with people clothed, that's a win. Yeah. And you're going to make their life more difficult. And they don't actually see that maybe that might not be the best way of approaching this situation. I mean, Rakeem, the obviously the Uxbridge by-election is not a kind of lone example of a sort of public fight back. We've seen the Gilets jaunes in France. That actually started as a, a, a revolt against the eco-tax. We've seen a huge uprising in, in Holland, um, in the Netherlands for, with farmers. The rise of the Farmers' Party as well. Yeah, exactly. It's been a farmers' protest, huge success for the Farmers' Party, protesting against kind of eco restrictions. I mean, is is this the way to challenge it, do you think? Do you, you know, do we need a sort of people's revolt against the net zero? I, I, I think that, that that has to be the way forward. And I think one point I'd make is, is you were talking about, you know, people um, encouraging others to, you know, travel within England as opposed to taking the plane. Uh, the, the, the reality is, say if I wanted to go to Cornwall by train, that's far more expensive than taking a, a, a you know a return plane ticket to many European destinations. Yeah. So I think again, you have to look at what are the alternatives, what, what are the choices. I, I think more generally, what, what what we are suffering from is these sort of this eco eco dogma, you could say. And France is referring to the this sort of privileged middle class activists often who are you know on the elderly and young um who haven't truly experienced economic hardship that uh, that's the truth of it and i think that if we want to make uh, by the way i'd make the point that i think overall we're still an environmentally friendly country um at large and if you actually look at the environmental performance index um produced by yale britain is the leading major industrialized um, democracy in that index. So I think the question is, what are the practical ways and what is an inclusive way to create an even more environmentally sustainable society? I think we need to move the debate in that kind of direction. And, you know, Francis, what do you think? Do you think the revolt is only going to get stronger? I mean, because it seems as if the the restrictions are only going to get more punishing. Well, the problem is, is what you have is a two-party system. Well, you have a three-party system. So Labour don't represent the working class. The Conservatives aren't Conservatives, and the Liberal Democrats are neither Liberal nor Democratic. So at that point, what are you actually left with? What political party represents the interests of the people? And the reality is is that none of them do. Mm. We're absolutely screwed when it comes to the democratic system. I, it's got to the point with me where I actually think we, we're probably going to need some form of PR. Because I think this is the only way to break the stranglehold of Labour and Conservative. Mm. Because when you look back at UKIP, when they had, what I think they got something like 4.4 million votes in elections, something like that, and they didn't win one seat. And you think, or come they, on. They, or it was like one, yeah, one seat out of that 4 million. Yeah. And you go, the, you go, the system is rigged and, it, and it's not working. And I think if you talk to somebody on the left and you go to them, and we've been getting a lot of uh, left-wing people on trigonometry recently, don't believe the rumours, and we've been asking them, are you excited by Keir Starmer? <laughs> they just look at me like I've pissed on their chips. Yeah. And then you ask a right-winger, oh, are you excited by the Conservative Party? And it's even worse. Mm. So the reality is, is nobody is represented under this democracy, which is, when you look at it and you're being brutally honest, is actually a very dangerous place to be. So the Labour Party has finally formulated a policy on gender recognition. It's decided that it is against gender self-identification, although it does want to kind of streamline the process by which someone who is born a man uh, can legally become a woman. Now, Rakib, this issue has caused Labour a hell of a lot of trouble. Uh, Keir Starmer has 
constantly made a fool of himself by flitting from saying, you know, women, it's wrong to say that women, only women have service, cervixes. Then he says that women can have penises, but only but 99.9% of them don't. And finally this week, he's come out and said mm. that a woman is an adult human female. Why has it been so painful? Why did it take him so long to get to that point and to just open the dictionary definition? Mate, I've got no idea what's going on with the Labour Party sometimes. <laughs> I really, really don't. But I know one thing, the Labour Party, could, it can't be both the political arm of Stonewall and the party of British Muslim traditionalists, put it that way. <laughs> it's very very difficult to, to reconcile those groups. Mm. Uh, I, I've been very disappointed by you know the, the, the radical transgenderism which has taken hold on the modern British left. Um, decidedly misogynistic in character. Uh, by the way, I think that um, the likes of Rosie, Rosie Duffield has been treated terribly within her own political party. Uh, I, I think that what it really shows is how the, the Labour Party, in a sense, it, it, to too many people uh, within it are just fundamentally divorced from reality. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I think that th this is a step in the right direction. But for me, I just think, just keep it simple. A woman is an adult human female. Well, just, just just leave it at that and 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 I, and I think that labor should be really concerned that w what took place before this and, and and I still want to see the party say that, that there's there's certain um sensitive spaces which have to remain rigidly same sex in nature what I mean by that is um the kind of places I'm referring to rape crisis centers yeah. um, domestic violence sanctuaries uh, public toilets um prisons as well um, but what's really interesting now, it seems like there's a bit of friction between the National Party and Scottish Labour mm. over this issue. But I, I really hope that the national leadership stay, not just stays firm on their current position. I, I, I want to see them move to an even clearer position because I still think this position is a bit murky um, in some places. I think I think that's right. Yeah, it's talking about modernising uh, gender recognition, mm. uh, the gender recognition process. So reducing the sort of medical requirements while keeping, uh, you know, so you have to see fewer doctors, for instance, but still they want to say gender dysphoria has to be a requirement. Annalise Dodds, for instance, says we will protect women's single sex spaces. I mean, we'll see how long that lasts, I guess. Six um, minutes. Yeah. The thing that really has brought this to a head, and, and Keir Starmer has admitted this, um, the thing that seems to have changed their mind most is what happened in Scotland with yep. Nicola Sturgeon and the disaster of you know, male rapists appearing in women's prisons. Female rapists, mate. Uh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Please be respectful. She, yeah. She, she. Yes. Hey, hey, look, exactly. And, the, you know, it was quite... Annalise Dodds had a little bit of a dig and said, oh, the only reason that the SNP did that is because they were trying to get one over on Westminster. It's like, no, they just drunk the Kool-Aid harder than you did, love. Yeah. Number one, let's be honest about it. And the whole Isla Bryson thing, I thought was magnificently hilarious. Here you had a two-time male rapist with a face tattoo rem reminiscent of Mike Tyson at his most <laughs> mental, who suddenly identified a w as a woman because he bought a pair of pink leggings in Primark and found a blonde wig in a skip. And all of a sudden, that suddenly meant that he could then have access to a women's prison. It was so magnificently demented. It was beautiful. It highlighted how completely and utterly ludicrous the Scottish National Party is and how actually... If you don't know what a woman is, right, and you if you are if you ask that question to a politician and they are unable to answer you, how are they going to run the NHS? How are they going to run the the Home Office? How are they going to run the country? They can't. They can't even say to a rapist, "Mate, you're not allowed in a women's prison." Yeah, that's where we are. That's where we are. It used to be, and she had a crap haircut. <laughs> I mean, it used to be the case that you'd ask a politician what the price of a pint of milk was to sort of catch them as out of touch. Now you ask them, can a woman have a penis? And you just watch them, you know, freak out because they know <laughs> that, you know, they can't say no, the common sense answer that the public wants to hear because that will offend the trans activists. Yeah. But they also know that they can't. Because women can have wangs, mate. <laughs> but they also know they can't just say, well, a woman is anyone who decides because that is 
you know, mental, mental, and will alienate the whole public. So you get this this kind of Keir Starmer compromise of ninety nine point nine percent of women not having penises, <laughs> and therefore one in a thousand women walking around with with giant willies. But the, what's what is striking is how the extent to which the political class has really brought bought into this idea, Rakeem. I mean, you get the sense mm. that Labour's new policy that it's released is kind of coming out through gritted teeth. It's like they've they've crashed into reality a little bit. But it's probably not where they'd like to be. Why have they bought into it so much? I think that within the parliamentary party, uh, there's a lot of younger MPs who I've got. I suspect that they were socialised on campuses and bought into these kind of radical identitarian ideas, which completely go against um, scientific reality. Um, and I think there's just a view as well that. You know, they, they treat the LGBT community as some kind of homogenous whole, which is simply not the case. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think there's a tendency within the Labour Party. They did it a bit with BAME, the yeah. BAME acronym mm. as well. They're just like homo- putting together quite a different groups and saying, oh, this is a victimised block. Well, they don't say block. They perceive it to be a block. But this is a victimised group which needs our allyship. They don't understand the diversity within those acronyms. Um, and, and they just do it as a way to just appear very virtuous and fashionable. But in this case, what they've actually done, is, in my view, they've probably alienated a lot of ordinary women mm. who feel that there's a cultural erasure, erasure of women, um, things such as breastfeeding being replaced with chest feeding, you know, using terms like bleeders. For, for, bonus you know, hole. Women have a, yeah, I, bonus I, I find it actually grossly offensive towards <laughs> women. That's the truth of it. And Labour need to put a stop to it. Because I, I, I think that there is, you know, many of those women, I think it, it's an issue, issue that's very important to them. And if Labour don't struck, strike a common sense position, um, they could alienate many voters who would usually, they'd probably consider Labour to be their natural party. And, and finally, let's talk a bit about the TERFs, yeah. um, the trans-exclusionary radical feminists um, or gender-critical feminists, whatever you want to call them. Before now, you know, one of those women had said what Keir Starmer said this week, a mm-hmm. woman is an adult human female. They would be rained down on like a ton of bricks. They yeah. would have been cancelled. They would have been shamed. They would have been smeared. But now it's okay to say that women are women, men are men. Well, I think it's because we had that watershed moment with Isla Bryson Mm. where suddenly we kind of woke up and realised that the real world isn't a gender studies class in some two-bit university in a crap town in the UK. So people have actually realised that there's very real-world consequences to this. And the SNP have paid the price as a result. And what Labour have done is they've seen the way the SNP have gone all the way down this rabbit hole. They realise they can't go all the way down there. Mm. But they don't want to appear to be bigoted because what people on the left fear more than anything else is their friends being nasty to them. So they've come up with this fudge, which is the exact same thing they did with Brexit. Do you remember the, the demented... Corbyn <laughs> idea of Brexit, of how they were going to honour the Brexit vote. And then, yeah, and have another referendum, but we'll campaign against Brexit, but we'll implement... I, I don't think anyone understood no, it. it just no, it was... Out of the room. It, it, was, it was. It was like you got Christopher Nolan to direct Brexit. <laughs> no one understood what was going on, mate. Yeah, and this is the Labour Party all over. They're so terrified of appearing... Uh, bigoted or having some kind of view that might offend people that they just do terrible fudge after terrible fudge after terrible fudge. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spikes' other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.